Hello and welcome everyone to uh, this webinar. I'm very pleased that uh, so many of you um, can join us uh, today. Um, we have a diverse audience really from the US, the UK and uh, from across the Middle East. So a warm welcome to, uh, to you all um, to what would be close to 90 minutes discussion on Egypt, the Middle East, uh, with Minister Nabil Fahmi and our distinguished uh, panel. Let me first start by introducing myself. My name is uh, Dr. Hassan al Um I am lecturer um, in the War Studies Department at King's College London and affiliate with uh, Sciences Po. We're hosted here today by King's College London, the Institute of Middle East Studies and the School of Security Studies. And we're here to discuss Minister Nabil Fahmi's book, Egypt's, Egypt's Diplomacy in War, Peace and Transition. Um, the book was published straight before the lockdown by Palgrave. Um, it carries Minister Fahmi's recollections and analyses. Um, and I hope he doesn't mind me doing the math of nearly 30 years of engagement with foreign policy in Egypt and the Middle East in various positions in and out of government. Um, it's a book that is written with candor and honesty uh, that seeks to provide um, a voice from the region on some of the region's most pressing issues. It's also a book that is concerned with the future of Egypt and the region. Um, and I found it very interesting how Mr. Fahmi reflecting on, on why he wrote that book, right, uh, it was a sense of personal dismay that the past two generations in the Arab world were handing over the Middle East to future leaders in a far worse state than it was when they took charge of it. Just a flavor of the candor and honesty of that book. One of the themes that cuts across this book is that Egypt has been in a long transition, not only since 2011 or 2013, but since 1952. In a sense, his written testimony is also a, a contribution towards the country's soul-searching endeavors looking forward. This is an important contribution to our understanding of the Middle East peace process and the literature around it, Egyptian foreign policy, uh, Mubarak years, and the politics of the Arab Spring, a full list really of key issues. Okay, let me um, tell you how we're going to run the event and first introduce um, our panelists. Um, I'll introduce first the author, Minister Nabil Fahmi, who was Egypt's foreign minister from 2013 to 2014 during a turbulent point of Egypt's history. He's a career diplomat among other posts. He served as Egypt's ambassador to the US for nearly nine years seeing up close the developments related to 9-11, uh, global war on terror, uh, the Iraq war under Bush administration, was also political advisor to Amr Musa during most of the 90s, providing him with a good vantage point on the Middle East peace process. He's the founding dean of the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy in the American University in Cairo. It's a really great pleasure to have you uh, here with us. Um, on our panel today, and I think he has not joined us yet, but will hopefully join us very soon, is Ambassador Martin um, Indek, Indek, sorry, um, who is currently Distinguished Fellow in the U.S. Council of Foreign Relations. Um, Ambassador Indek uh, held a number of positions in the U.S. government related to the Middle East, including Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. U.S. Ambassador to Israel, I believe twice, um, and the U.S. Special Envoy for the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. Um, and then we also have Sir Derek Plumley, who is visiting professor at King's College London. Sir Derek served as British Ambassador to Egypt between 2003 and 2007. Um, and Saudi Arabia before that. He was also at some point director of the Middle East and North Africa in the UK Foreign Office and Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Uh, he also served as the UN Special Coordinator for Lebanon and chaired the International Commission which oversaw the implementation of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in Sudan. He's also a trustee and chairman of the Arab British Center which uh, is having really an impressive online set of activities during lockdown, so I encourage you all to, to check it out. 
Um, so what we're going to do today is that we will start with Minister Fahmi, who will provide us with a quick highlights of the book, some of the themes that he wants to bring to uh, this discussion. This will be for around 10, 15 minutes. Um, we will then move to have quick intervention from each of the panelists, uh, Ambassador uh, Index or Derek, and then myself. Um, uh, we will then go back to uh, Minister Fahmi for some responses and then open up for um, the audiences to put uh, questions. Um, please note that this uh, event is recorded and will be made available on YouTube um, at a future date. Um, if you have any questions at any point of the proceedings, feel free to put them down in the Q&A uh, channel at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. Uh, please put your name and your affiliation and your question then, and then we'll bring it to the discussion. All in all, I, I aim to include the session by 6 p.m. London time. Um, thank you all for joining. And Mr. Fahmi, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion. And the floor is yours. OK. Let's see what. There we are. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bethemi. Thank you very much. My appreciation to King's College for the uh, generosity of hosting this event. And of course, my appreciation and thanks to the two panelists, Ambassador Plumbia and Ambassador Indic, uh, both of whom uh, have long exper expertise in this subject we're going to talk about, as well as uh, being uh, distinguished interlocutors I've had over the years. I say this uh, in complete objectivity. We have remained close friends. Uh, whether we agreed or disagreed on policy issues, that's a different issue. I think we did both uh, as time went by. To cut a long story short, this book is not an autobiography. I wrote it for two basic reasons. First reason is I felt there was an absence of an, ad of an Arab voice in the foreign language uh, literature, aid, uh, market, excuse me, in terms of international relations. I wanted the Arab voice to be out there for non-Arab speakers. That's why I wrote the book originally in English. The second reason I wrote the book, and that's more for the Arabic version of the book, which will be longer and more detailed, <clears throat> is exactly what you said, Hassan, that I feel a great responsibility in providing my experience, good and bad, uh, for the record, for the younger generation to learn from what we did, to gain from what we achieved, and to do better from what we did not achieve. Uh, it seems the most commonly quoted phrase in the book is the one you quoted, because I keep hearing it at me, but I said it honestly, and I'm being very candid in the book. Uh, my expressions of criticism, by the way, are not opposition as much as they are a desire to do more and expectation that we should do more. But yes, I do believe that our generation uh, is handing over the region to others uh, at the very least at the level that I wouldn't have liked it to be. That being said, to uh, give you context a little bit, I shied away from talking about myself. Then my first reader said, the book will last much longer than you will. So you need to provide some context of why you think the way you did. And the context is quite simple. I was born at the beginning of the Cold War era, at an era of transformation internationally and regionally. My professional career uh, was throughout that. And I was born into a family of public servants on the uh, paternal side. Grandfather was attorney general. My father was foreign minister. So, And I mentioned these only to make the point that International affairs were day-to-day -day discussions. They weren't something you went out to study. We lived that every day. Uh, and secondly, meeting important people was, again, I don't mean to be pompous, but it was the normal state of affairs. Ironically, because of that, I decided not to be a diplomat to start off with. Uh, and I was never glamorized by meeting important people. Ultimately, I joined 
the foreign ministry by mere coincidence. Uh, but that's for another time, unless it's a question that comes from the floor. Uh, the book gives you four perspectives about these subjects. One perspective is a young adult in society. I was completing high school when the 67 war started, and it was the first shock, if you, if you want. Uh, I wanted to give you my voice, so it had to relate to some position I was in. That position at the time was not a practitioner, it was simply a member of society. The second one was when my father was foreign minister, I was very close to events. I was in the army at the time, and then I ultimately joined the foreign minister ministry later. But I, could, I was a witness to everything happening after the 73 war and the negotiations. So that's, if you want, a close witness. The third perspective is a practitioner. You mentioned uh, my different uh, positions in the, in, the gov in the diplomacy. And then finally, as a principal, as foreign minister. And from those four perspectives, I deal with four basic books. First part is the personal part, short. The second part is the foreign policy part, everything from peace process to um, Egyptian-American relations to Africa, so on and so forth. And then I ultimately write about, uh, before writing about the future, I write about transition in Egypt because I was the prince, I was a foreign minister during transition and uh, it was a historic responsibility to write about that as well. I don't write about it much from the domestic part, although I do, but more the implications on foreign policy or how foreign policy plays in. Now, that being said, uh, if I, I'm gonna skip the personal part, except what I said that I never intended to be a diplomat. Uh, I did it because I like international relations and I was challenged to try. And my father was completely against it, by the way. He uh, was a tremendous personality, but a person who felt that you'll have to live your own life not relive somebody else's. So, uh, but again, that's a long story. In dealing with the foreign policy issues, I'm gonna run through some highlights and some important lessons on the different issues as I go along. Uh, first thing is the regional context. If one looks at my regional context as a young adult onwards, I grew up in pan Arabis. And I would argue that the 67 war was the death knell of Pan-Arabism politically as an attractive force. It shocked everybody and people started to move away from Pan-Arabism, uh, even though Pan-Arabism didn't fail because of the war, it failed because it became static, wasn't forward looking and wasn't responding to the needs of its people. But again, 67 was, okay, this is not working. You better look for something else. I would jump also that the 1990 Iraqi invasion of Kuwait was the end of any security, any serious security cooperation between Arab countries. It changed the security paradigm in the Arab world. Uh, very few people afterwards started to talk about the collective self-defense and so on and so forth. And it was more dependency, more, not new, a dependency on foreign powers uh, for security reasons. 2003, the American invasion of Iraq, which was baseless, even though uh, Saddam was a bloody tyrant. Uh, 2003 created tremendous imbalance in the Middle East between Arabs and non-Arabs, or, or added to it, and added to it a sectarian faction element that was not there in the past. 67 to 2003, the Arab world, the Middle East, excuse me, I make the mistake of, that Arabs often make. Uh, Middle East was, for people like me, Arab world and others. By 2003, it started becoming Middle East and some Arabs, or the Middle East and the Arabs, uh, with the changing political balance. Uh, let me, with that context, and I'll come back to some issues. The Arab-Israeli peace process, something I did uh, from the very beginning of uh, my professional career. But the irony of it is that the peace process actually started because of a war, not because of peace initiative. Before 1973, Egypt tried several times, Sadat tried several times to 
suggest peace initiatives, and they were completely ignored because people did not take him seriously, be that the Israelis or the Americans, and for that matter, a number of Arabs and Egyptians. But the 73 war, the change in the political balance uh, was enough to create uh, an incentive for peace, peace, a recognition that there were different parties there, a mutual respect for the different parties. And I will mention just one example anecdotally. Uh, I'm not sure if Martin's on the line yet, but anyway. Uh, he is. American, yeah. Oh, good, good, great. American presidents uh, meet foreign dignitaries very, very carefully. And they're very careful about protocol, prestige, and all that stuff. Uh, in 1973, right after the war, my father, who was the interim foreign minister, he was minister of tourism, actually, was sent to see Kissinger, uh, excuse me, Nixon, uh, and of course, Dr. Kissinger. And President Nixon, after the meeting, walked him all the way out to his car. So not only did he meet a foreign minister, not his, not his, his counterpart, but he actually walked him all the way out to the car. The message in the meeting and outside was, after the war, especially that the Soviets had been asked to leave Cairo before that, Egypt is now a player. We want to engage you, engage with you to, to work on the region and, and the world together. So that war enabled the peace processes after that. Without it, it would not have been possible. First mistake after the war, I would argue, was the Syrian mistake of not going to the very first Geneva Conference. Had they gone to the very first Geneva Conference, which was under the UN umbrella with the two superpowers, the process would have remained within the UN context and it would have remained, uh, if you want, regionally and multilaterally. Uh, they didn't. And that, frankly, was a negative message to everyone not only to foreigners, by the way, even to Egypt and Egyptians, because while Egypt was ready to cooperate with Syria and would thereafter, it was not going to allow anybody to have a veto one way or the other. So I think that was a, a strategic mistake uh, at the time, uh, which could have easily been, uh, um, been avoided and would have helped, frankly, the Arab position. The, uh, process then went on, disengagement agreements, ultimately the Jerusalem visit, and, uh, and then the Egyptian-Israeli agreement. And that raises a question. Uh, if you look at the Egyptian-Israeli agreement, which came after the Jerusalem visit, and you look at what had been offered before that, uh, the content is very similar. In other words, the ultimate agreement was very similar to what had been offered even before the visit. And the interesting point here is, I've always believed that Egyptian-Israeli peace was possible if Egypt agreed to do it. But we did not want to do a bilateral agreement until then. It's only then that we decided to do that. But before that, frankly, if Egypt had agreed to do a bilateral agreement, Israel, in my opinion, would have agreed because it immediately means that there's not going to be any full-fledged Arab-Israeli war afterward if the Egyptian army is not party to that. But let me jump forward very quickly. We went back to regionalism and a comprehensive approach at the Madrid peace process, which was interesting because it had a regional context, but it also had the bilateral negotiations, the face-to-face -face negotiations, which ultimately are necessary when you're negotiating peace agreements. And it also brought in uh, the UN legitimacy and so on. And you all know the, the history of uh, that process plus the Oslo process the parallel negotiating trends uh, back and forth on different things. And let me summarize again what I think were missed opportunities and bad uh, and mistakes. I said Geneva de Giva one was the first mistake. I would argue that the Rabin, Rabin Perez team on the Israeli side uh, was instrumental in moving things forward in a positive sense, but they could have moved more quickly Especially, especially on settlements, and it would have helped, frankly, get things done and make them irreversible. Regrettably uh, and tragically, uh, Rabin was assassinated, uh, as was Sadat also. The second Camp David agreement, and that's not between, that was Palestine, Israel, was a case study in mismanagement in terms of timing, 
bad timing. You brought the parties together who disliked each other. Barak didn't speak to Arafat. And likewise, uh, they were sequestered in a closed environment. And then, uh, amusingly enough, the, my American colleagues would actually ask, oh, they actually asked President Mubarak. They phoned President Mubarak and said, could you please tell Arafat to accept our Jerusalem proposal? And sorry, they didn't phone him. They sent their, their ambassador. And when he said, what's the proposal? He said, well, we can't tell you. So he phoned me. And he said, what's the proposal? I said, they're not returning phone calls. So he said, OK, tell them I don't give blank checks. So even with, with parties that were friends with the US who wanted to push peace forward, who would have been engaged, the, the lack of, I mean, the, or the diplomatic mismanagement was uh, a real reason for why this, this summit failed. The third mistake was the Clinton parameters. Clinton parameters were not perfect, but I think, I think President Arafat should have accepted them with reservations. And he actually told me that before he left uh, Washington, but that did not become the public uh, position afterwards. I think he should have pocketed that, those and negotiated some of the details because not having that ultimately meant that the Bush administration and so on and so forth was not going to be supported. Another mistake, Arab Peace Initiative 2002, which provided a regional solution to the whole process in exchange for full withdrawal. The Israelis were mistaken in not immediately embracing that and then maybe negotiating some details. The Arabs were mistaken in not promoting it further. It appeared to be reactive to 9-11 rather than an initiative reacted to 9-11 to change the subject rather than a serious peace initiative. And it would have taken us far ahead. Omar Abu Mazen, Prime Minister Omar offered Abu Mazen proposals on refugees in Jerusalem that have never been offered since then. And that was a big mistake from President Abu Mazen. Uh, and the last mistake I'd, I'd add here is nobody can underestimate the role of the US, given its influence, particularly this generation. But the big mistake we make is to overestimate their role. And I think giving the US alone the responsibility of negotiating Middle East peace was wrong because they're not, they never were, and they never will be an honest broker. And secondly, their own domestic composition uh, forces certain tendencies that make it impossible uh, to take position that even the U.S. would want to take if it was the U.S. plus or other countries plus the U.S., then it would give the U.S. more room for maneuver and it would allow us to take advantage of U.S. influence. Uh, and I mentioned these, and, I, and again, if I take you to the Obama carry years, the Obama carry years, the real problem between the U.S. And, and Martin, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here, the ultimate disagreement was between the Israelis and the Americans, much more than between the Palestinians uh, and the Americans. Uh, and Martin has all the details for that. But anyway, I've just mentioned a couple of these. If we're going to move to peace, you, we need to be, leaders need to be committed to peace. They need to have the courage to take risks, but they need to have the wisdom to say yes and the patience to negotiate because as the saying is, is often said, the, the devil is in the details. Uh, and I would argue that it's important to look at developing critical mass, be that regionally or internationally, for these agreements to remain sustained. Um, let me run through a couple of things relating to Egypt diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis different countries around the world. I think our relations with the US are indispensable, but have always been uncomfortable except for very short periods of time, and will remain so. The reason being, there's a, there's a if you want, a, a bit of a, a contradiction or a conflict between what is known as American exceptionalism and Egypt's, what, how Egypt sees itself in light of its heritage. The fact that America sees that it has a particular kind of role internationally, well, we do the same region. And that tends to ultimately 
uh, create friction between uh, how each one of us works independently. Um, I would argue also one of our big mistakes, and it has been mutually beneficial, the relationship to both sides. One of our biggest mistakes has been we've taken the relationship for granted. We allowed it to run on the basis of the Arab-Israeli peace process at the very beginning. Uh, well, there's much more to that. So 20 years after the peace process, when you went around Congress, around the states, and you talked about Egypt, US, you can't talk about history in the states. You need to talk about the present and about the future. So Egyptians should have been talking more about our role in the region on a multitude of issues because we did have that role. The Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, we supported the American-led coalition. Uh, thirdly, I, on every topic I will talk about, and I say this to my own colleagues back home, much more to my foreign friends, Overdependence on anybody, friend or foe, is a big mistake. And I think there was an overdependence uh, from the Egyptian side on America, and it created misunderstandings on the American side and discomfort on the Egyptian side. Russia. Um, again, a country like Egypt, which is an important role, does not have the choice of being isolated uh, if it wants to play its role has to have relations with a multitude of powers, including the Soviet Union and or after that, Russia. But it's not Russia in place of America and America in place of Russia. It has to be a function of real interest on both sides. Uh, both the Russians and the Americans look towards our region, looking for Middle Eastern players and partners. So uh, I was, the main proponent of opening up with Russia, but I said openly in Moscow and back home in Cairo, this is not to, to replace America by you. I'm going to promote Egyptian American relations and Egyptian Russian relations at the same time. I'll be very candid with you. What Russia can offer on a day to day basis does not compare to what America can offer on a day to day basis. In spite of America's shrinking role regionally and internationally, but I would argue that ignoring Russia is a big mistake. Uh, another point I would like to make, we had two revolutions in three years. Uh, two revolutions in three years are basically a call for people to be partners in deciding what to do, and they wanted to express independence. So on foreign policy, you needed to also assert your decision-making posture, not that you're depending on anybody. And therefore, we opened up southwards towards Africa, eastwards towards Asia. Uh, I made more trips to Africa than any other continent during my one year uh, in office. And it wasn't only on the Nile, on the Renaissance Dam and the Nile issue. Let me, uh, I'll go on for too long, but let, quick, quickly, in light of that, if you want to have a correct foreign policy, you need to start off with your regional foundation as your springboard, and then move outwards. You have to have multiple choices. You need to draw uh, lessons from the past, but you have to look forward. It is not enough to keep re reiterating what happened in the past, unless you're a player moving forward, unless you have the vision. And I, the vision, I mean the strat, the vision, you have a strategy to implement the vision, and then you have the assets to actually pursue the tactics necessary to get there. Um, anecdotally, and then I will close in two, two or three minutes maximum. Uh, when I was minister, I used to say that my nightmares are better than my days. Uh, the reason being nightmares are short. You wake up very, very quickly. Uh, no minister sleeps for very long. And then you wake up and they're not true. But I used to wake up and I would see Libya on fire, Syria on fire, no Arab Israeli peace process, looking for, uh, southwards towards Sudan and Ethiopia, we have a problem there over and above the issue of terrorism and Iran and the Gulf and so on. So these were difficult times and they required, uh, frankly, a new outlook, a proactive, forward looking outlook. Two points I'd like to make, one point I'd like to make before. Uh, a couple of minutes on the transition area. One, 
issue of tremendous importance to us was regional security and specifically uh, non-proliferation of nuclear weapons and, and the sorts. And I can tell you that this, we made the mistake of joining the NPT back in 1981, not because we don't want to join NPT, but because our condition used to be, we will join it if all of our regional players join and we joined it unilaterally and that was a mistake. And I remember uh, years later talking to Richard Pearl and raising this issue and he said, well, why in the world should your neighbors join if you join? Now, what do you do when you get that kind of answer? Uh, the second mistake we made, frankly, was after we joined in the 1995 uh, extension conference, uh, we overreached. I say this because there was a suggestion on the table to renew the agreement 25 years revolving. And the non-aligned countries insisted, no, we want less than that. And ultimately, the, the balance of power swayed and the, the votes moved much more to, moved towards an indefinite extension, uh, especially when South Africa broke ranks with the non-aligned movement. So again, this is a negotiating tactic where we overreached and we would have actually had a better position had we had the wisdom to accept a, a less ambitious target. Uh, the issue of transition. Everybody likes to say transition each started in 2011. No, it started in 1952. And I say that because we have been searching for a consensual social contract that includes us all since 1952. A contract which allows people of different opinions to participate in under one constitution, one identity of being Egyptians, not multiple identities, one identity of being Egyptians, uh, but which you have public, private, uh, uh, left-leaning, right-leaning, all in the middle. If you look at uh, our three presidents, I'm going to skip President Naguib because he spent a very short time, but if I took Nasser Sadat and Mubarak, uh, just, just quickly, each one of them came in with a very important initial message. Uh, Nasser wanted to expand regionally, and he did. Uh, Sadat wanted to end war, move towards modernity, and the West, and he did. Mubarak wanted to restabilize the country and replace it back into the middle of the Arab world, and he did. And they all ended up with tragic conclusions. Their most problematic mistakes were domestic much more than foreign policy because of the absence of the social contract. It does not mean that each one of them didn't have major achievements. They did. But again, as I said, I'm always trying to get a better result. So I would argue that they all did some very good things, but we did not, we're not where we want to be now because we've continued to search for the social, con social contract. We are doing that in the middle of regional instability. We've seen an erosion of our own soft power as that happens. And that's happened, frankly, because if you don't have efficient governance, when I say efficient governance, I mean primarily checks and balances in the system so that you have different voices out there. But second, there's also openness, which if you, there's a level after that politically is, not after that in the sequence, but, but related to that is also democracy. But I would argue that we lost, we lost soft power when we started to contain people's thoughts. And the regional states in, in, in the Arab and Middle East stopped looking to Egypt as the country they wanted to emulate and started to look toward Western Europe or towards the States or, uh, or recently towards Asia. So we need to go back and focus on our, uh, grow on our soft power. My concluding points are the following. With all of our problems and our challenges, I think we have the depth that far exceeds anybody else in the Arab world. Nobody in the Arab world could have survived two revolutions in three years and still had 
an up and running state, and we did. So uh, that is to our credit, but we can do more, and we need to do more domestically and regionally by having a vision, by planning strategies, and by working rationally both domestically and uh, regionally to really make the best use of our assets. Let me stop with those points because I can see my two colleagues, the panelists, uh, scribbling, and I think written down too many things for me to answer. But thank you, Hassan. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for sharing um, your opening um, remarks. Uh, we are already getting um, a lot of questions. Um, if you've joined us uh, late, welcome uh, once more. We have a very long uh, list of participants, so there, there are going to be a lot of questions. If you have any question that you want to post to the panel, please feel free to do so. You can do so by using the Q&A channel at the bottom of your Zoom uh, screen. Please identify your name and your affiliation. Um, and then we'll put the questions to the panel. Okay, so I um, described earlier how we're going to run this and we want to have more of, um, of a discussion. Obviously, there are so much to cover um, and so many different topics that we can bring from nuclear weapons, uh, WMD free zone in the Middle East issues, Arab Spring, um, US foreign policy in the region, um, Arab-Israeli peace process, so many different topics and issues. So in terms of the next stage of the discussion, what we decided on doing is giving five, 10 minutes to each of the panelists, sort of like to pick on one of the theme, uh, one of the themes uh, that uh, Minister Fahmi raised in his book, uh, and then we'll go back to Minister Fahmi and for, for discussion. So can I ask please Ambassador um, Indek uh, to uh, share his thoughts? This will be for five to 10 minutes. This will be followed by Sir Derek, um, and then very quickly myself, and then we'll go back to Mr. Nabil. So um, Ambassador Indek, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, Ambassador Fahmi Nabil, uh, it's a real uh, honor for me to participate in this panel and to um, have the opportunity to discuss your uh, fascinating uh, book. Uh, I'm very grateful to you for writing it. And I think that students of Middle Eastern history, students of the Arab-Israeli conflict, and uh, students of the geopolitics of the region uh, will all benefit greatly uh, from reading your book. Uh, your candor, your self-criticism, uh, your anecdotes, uh, all, uh, I think, make it a very compelling uh, read. And so uh, for those of you here, uh, if you haven't read it, I hope you will. Um, it, there are, unfortunately, and, and Nabil knows this uh, better than most, um, few uh, accounts uh, from the Arab perspective uh, of the history of what has happened in this tumultuous region. Um, that are based on uh, documentation because unfortunately there's very little documentation available uh, and that's because I gather it really hasn't been archived uh, effectively which is unfortunate uh, and therefore we are really dependent on the biographies of the critical players and uh, the Egyptian critical players uh, are the ones that have taken the lead in, in doing this. And Nabil follows a, um, a tradition there, uh, one that was really started by his father uh, with his uh, book about the uh, negotiations uh, back in the days of Anwar Sadat. Um, but there are, are others that have also um, recorded their memoirs and, and um, most recently, uh, Ahmed Abu Ghaid, another Egyptian foreign minister, uh, has done so. And I think that's a very important contribution. Memoirs naturally uh, uh, have a um, bias uh, built into them, but I think that um, Nabil has done a great job in terms of uh, uh, 
recounting events in, a, in an analytical framework that I found uh, uh, not just um, interesting and helpful, but um, uh, I discovered a whole lot of things that I didn't know uh, about the period in which uh, Nabil and I were negotiating together. Um, including one incident in the book uh, that he uh, repeats about time when I got quite stroppy <laughs> with him. Um, and uh, I now discovered that, uh, that there was good reason for me to be so, to do so. But we can uh, leave that for our own uh, uh, drinks. Uh, later on. Um, I want to focus on two things quickly uh, that I think Nabil has highlighted in his analysis that I think are particularly important. The first is uh, what he says about uh, the Arab-Israeli peace process and, and uh, Egypt's role in it. And the second is uh, regional geopolitics and Egypt's role there, which I think is correct in saying that um, was not is not really appreciated uh, in Washington, except by those who deal, have dealt with Egypt and understand its weight in the, in the, in the regional system uh, and uh, try to work with Egypt to advance uh, a common interest. But it's not commonly known. And I think Nabil is right that more could have and should still be done to educate um, Washington about that. I'm, uh, I think the most re uh, recent incident where that was driven home to me was when the uh, Trump administration tried to organize uh, the Middle East Strategic Alliance, the MISO, what's known as the Arab NATO, uh, which was basically their idea, somewhat like the Baghdad Pact of the 1950s, to orchestrate um, Arab uh, countries against Iran. And of course, Egypt was critically important in this. And since they didn't understand Egypt's relationship with Iran, uh, which has not been an easy relationship by any means, but Egypt has a particular perspective on Iran that needs to be understood in Washington before you can go about trying to enlist Egypt in some kind of strategic alliance against Iran. Uh, and Nabil explains it in his book in a fascinating account of the relationship between Egypt and Iran that uh, Jared Kushner and Mike Pompeo would have done well to read it uh, before they tried to launch this. And the Middle East Strategic Alliance, for those of you who happen to follow this, came a cropper very quickly uh, simply because Egypt wasn't willing to go along with it. And without Egypt, there was no chance of putting together a strategic alliance. Um, so uh, I think that, that uh, Egypt's uh, role in the region is, is something that, that uh, we need to focus on. And it's because in particular now, and I'd be interested in Nabil's response to this, we have a situation in which the United States is essentially uh, engaged in a retrenchment from the region. It started with Obama, um, but it is being reinforced by Trump. And it is uh, caused by a number of factors, primarily uh, and the need to pivot to Asia where the United States faces uh, a much bigger geopolitical challenge in the rise of China. Uh, than it does in, in the Middle East today, especially with the reduction in America's dependence on Middle Eastern oil. So the strategic vitality of the, of the Middle East no longer uh, is there in the way that it used to be in the days when Nabil and I were actively involved. And um, that means that the United States is necessarily looking around to regional partners to play the roles that the United States once imagined that it could play, and I would say generally did it very badly, um, with the exception of the Egypt-Israel uh, peace agreements. Uh, but uh, the, the problem today is that we have a situation in which Egypt, 
in the words of one of your strategic thinkers, has gone into strategic hibernation. And at a time when Syria and Iraq are uh, simply collapsing and out of, out of the game and unable to play a regional role, uh, Saudi Arabia is trying to kind of fill the vacuum but I'm sure Nabil will be the first to explain that that doesn't work effectively, but we only have to look at the way that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman behaves to know that, uh, this, that uh, Saudi Arabia is a weak pillar for anybody trying to construct a stable regional order to depend upon. Uh, and so the traditional Arab regional powers are, are not there. And there's a vacuum that is uh, designed for Egypt to fill, and yet Egypt is not, it appears, willing to play that role at a time when it is, is very much needed. So let me just shift to the peace process quickly uh, and, and uh, say there that, that, again, Egypt was and is and will be a critical player in any effort to achieve a successful reconciliation between Israel and the Arab states, Israel and the Palestinians. Egypt was the leader of that effort. Um, if Egypt had not been prepared, as Nabil described it, to move from war to peace to use the 1973 October Yom Kippur War as the means of transitioning from war to peace. Uh, and of course, had Henry Kissinger and subsequently Jimmy Carter not worked with Anwar Sadat uh, to turn this into a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, uh, there would have been no uh, advance in, in peace between Israel and the Arabs. Uh, it was the critical, without sine qua non, without which nothing else uh, was possible. Um, but once that was done, and it was done in a way that we can say was suboptimal because it turned out to be a separate piece, but in the end, Egypt's role was, was established and it maintained that role through the critical periods that Nabil has described. And when we got to dealing with the Palestinian issue, we really needed Egypt um, to play the role of, of the supporter and, and uh, I would say trustee, although uh, perhaps that's not exactly the right word, custodian is too strong, but essentially the advisor and the anchor for the Palestinians and the cover for the Palestinians to be able to make the difficult uh, compromises um, for a reconciliation, a historic reconciliation between Israel and the Palestinians. And Egypt played that role uh, in a very important way for, for a long time. Uh, it wasn't always convenient to us, um, but it was essential. Uh, there was a time, I have to say, uh, and, and Nabil, essentially acknowledges this, a critical moment with the Clinton parameters. And I agree with him completely about the way that we screwed up Camp David too, and, and um, the embarrassing way in which we tried to get Egypt to come in there was a, a mistake not to engage with Egypt in the way that I've described because of its importance. But afterwards, with the Clinton parameters, Egypt was not willing to lend its weight to uh, the effort to get Arafat to agree. And uh, I think that that was a critical moment. You, you were fully briefed, as Nabil knows. We took your concerns into account. We worked with you. And yet at the critical moment, uh, Egypt wasn't there. And, and uh, maybe Nabil can respond to that. But I think that that, on the one hand, shows how important Egypt was and remains, I believe. But um, uh, at that critical moment, uh, Egypt was missing uh, in action. Now, 
we're at a critical juncture again. And Israel is about to drive a stake through the heart of the two-state solution if it goes ahead with this annexation uh, as proposed uh, in the Trump plan. And uh, where is Egypt? Egypt could put a stop to this like that if it were to stand up and say, no way can we go along with this. Um, Jordan would like to be able to say that, is trying to come up close to it, um, but it's too dependent on the United States, it's too weak to be able to take a stand. And of course, Egypt is also dependent on the United States, but it is much more capable of taking an independent stand uh, which is critically needed now if the uh, Israeli-Palestinian two-state solution, which is the only solution that will actually be a solution other than, you know, the other ones are just recipes for a continuation of the conflict. If that is to survive, uh, then, then this is the moment. And uh, I hope somehow that Egypt will find its voice, but the lack of an Egyptian voice just underscores the point that uh, Egypt's role geopolitically and in terms of peace has always been critical and is critical today. And we need Egypt to come back to its traditional role. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Indek, um, for your intervention. Um, uh, Cam David too really got a pointed treatment in, uh, in in the memoir. So I'm really looking forward to hear more about your views on that, perhaps in the in, in the discussion. Um, can I also ask Mr. Fahmi if you can g turn your video on, since since this is a discussion, I, I perhaps think this can be more conducive to um, to a dialogue. We are running um, slightly over time, uh, but we will catch up hopefully. Um, I'm very pleased to now give the floor uh, to Sir Derek who will um, share some thoughts on the Mubarak years, since he was ambassador of the UK in Egypt um, around that time. Over to you. Thanks, Hassan. Um, well, I'm delighted that our uh, Middle East Institute here at King's is uh, hosting this event, I must say. And it's an honor to share the screen with uh, Martin and uh, and Nabil, of course, and Martin, after a very long time, I have to say, uh, but we do go back quite a long way. Uh, and uh, I just, uh, I, well, I will add a caution as to my lack of tech savvy. So if I go silent, you'll have to uh, send me a t something, I don't know. Anyway, congratulations, first thing really, to Nabil on the book, exactly like uh, Martin, I must say. It's a really stimulating read. If you're reading something in lockdown, I would recommend it. You can include it and you'll benefit therefrom if you've got any interest in the politics of the Middle East at all, as I guess everybody who's uh, signed in does. Uh, and I agree also with what uh, Martin said about the shortage of sources, apart actually from uh, one or two other uh, Egyptian um, uh, diplomatic biographies, but direct from the horse's mouth, inside information um, sources on Arab diplomacy over this, uh, this period of time, uh, and particularly when there is actually no access for the scholars, certainly, either uh, to public records on the Arab side. So I think it's really, really valuable. Um, the period covered uh, is ex almost exactly that which I spent working in the Arab world, either on, either on, uh, either in the Arab world or outside it, but on um, uh, uh, the sort of issues we're talking about today. Uh, and I agree uh, very much with what Nabil says about the, if you look outside and survey the scene at the present moment, wherever you are in the Middle East, uh, it's pretty disheartening, uh, but particularly in those areas of conflict. So um, hopefully people will draw the, uh, useful lessons from what Nabil has said, because it's frank and it's very clear, I think, and in many cases, almost all cases actually, pretty convincing, frankly. 
Uh, I uh, have one obs an observation, which is slightly offside, but I, I feel impelled to do it. My first posting in Cairo uh, was from 1977 to 80. There was a time of great hope. It's already been discussed, of course. And I got to know through my job, which was basically liaising with the foreign ministry, uh, people, many of them who are now either retired or retiring, but uh, at that point, rising stars in the ministry and, of course, took notes on all the great figures. It left me with one very clear impression. And I do suppose it goes to what Martin was saying, too, about needing to call on Egypt for help in the circumstances uh, expressing with some of those we see today. And that is of the, the quality and the commitment and the professionalism of uh, the Egyptian Foreign Service collectively. I'm not, uh, you know, obviously not everybody, but basically that was an impression with which I went away, took with me, and I have found it to be an accurate impression almost everywhere I serve and whatever I've been doing. And it's a useful thing to have up your sleeve. Um, it was confirmed, I don't know, in New York in the mid 90s. I was uh, the uh, uh, British Security Council counselor, basically. And Nabil uh, sort of mentions at some point in the book that a French colleague said, well, you know, they were on the Security Council. When they're not on the Security Council, they're effectively the 16th member. At that time, Egypt certainly was very active on the sort of issues, any issues which were of concern in the Middle East. Uh, and it's worth remembering, um, really, and it was, was important. Actually, at that time, also, the NPT review conference that uh, uh, Nabil just mentioned um, took place. And if you read the story, because uh, Martin commends the uh, anecdotes uh, in the book. The anecdotes about that are really compelling, basically, as to how Egypt more or less snatched an element of victory from what he's uh, nobly described as a defeat and walked away with a commitment, which has never been honoured, of course, to a Middle East zone free of um, nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction, despite opposition in some quarters. Uh, I, I think, actually, you asked me to say something about the Mubarak years. I think they saw real successes for Egy Egyptian diplomacy, rebuilding bridges with Arab partners, Arab League returns to Cairo. And I think that Egypt's role in the in the Kuwait war, I mean, uh, it was a bit ambivalent about the war, but it seems to me that from it did stem very good things, including for Egypt and things which uh, um, Egyptian leadership and uh, and diplomats can be proud from debt relief all the way to the run up to the Madrid conference and so on. Um, where else to go? I won't uh, dwell on the Middle East peace process because Martin has done so magisterially and uh, I will probably position myself somewhere between the two of them, but they both know much more than me on the subject at that time. So I think this would be a waste of others' time. And I know people are anxious to ask questions. Um, I was ambassador in Cairo uh, for part of Nabil's time in Washington, and he's reflected at length on um, relations between the United States and Egypt. Um, unsurprisingly, I had a much easier time than he did. I mean, uh, a trouble-free relationship, essentially. But I can sympathize with what he says in the book about the way Egypt was hectored and manhandled, really, on uh, issues of essentially domestic affairs, the ones in which we all cared and were trying gently to encourage change and progress and uh, pluralism and so on um, over those years, and how that was taken by President Mubarak and so on, and the impact that it there had. One wonders sometimes whether if a different approach had been adopted but then probably the, it would be a very big if, because it would also have to include an if about the Iraq war, which certainly would, was going to happen. Um, things might have developed somewhat differently. I don't know. Uh, but the US would certainly have been in a position to give the sort of discreet advice, which might have been encouragement, which one feels might uh, have helped to some extent. Um, other than that, what to say? I mean, I... Um, my questions, my thoughts really uh, stemmed uh, more prospectively, I think, uh, rather as uh, Martin's second uh, um, uh, remarks did. Um, and 
I'm, in your time as foreign minister, Nabil, you uh, sought to promote a proactive Egyptian approach to diplomacy. And you cited conversations in the book with your Saudi and Iranian opposite numbers. Uh, and I can tell you that actually, without knowing of your role in instituting the sort of that intra-regional discussion um, uh, between them, uh, I was, I know from the book now, a beneficiary in what I was doing as a, um, as a UN official uh in the field where i was working so it just goes to show i think rather to underline um martin's point about egyptian heft if you know the word i mean egyptian egyptian diplomatic ability to make a difference even if i mean in the big scheme of things not the largest of them and of course that process that i'm referring to actually uh you refer to was overtaken by the yemen war and nothing more came of it but some good did come and it speaks to what good might come, I think, if Egypt were able to play a more active diplomatic role. Uh, I realize that there are all sorts of very pressing neighborhood issues, close neighborhood issues for Egypt at the present moment. But there are um, many things in terms of the, the sort of restabilization of the region, which is, I agree, also uh, something that's going to be much more multipolar in future. But the absence of an effective Egyptian pole will be felt um, uh, if it if it isn't there and isn't uh, pursuing um, issues like conflict resolution and promoting stability on a collective sense um, more than it seems uh, minded or able perhaps because of other preoccupations to do at present uh, and finally i would say um, I mean, actually, Hassan, right at the beginning of all things, did uh, announce that I was the chairman of the Arab British Centre in London. So this gives me a particular sort of pulpit from which to say, and I feel for the absence of a sort of collective uh, Arab sentiment at the present moment. There's certainly you know, cultural, linguistic ties, all the rest of it, but the divisions, uh, the political divisions are deep. And... Um, which is not to say that one's sort of advocating the absence of other players from the Middle East or even their, um, uh, uh, not playing a role in solving these various essentially Arab problems that uh, lay before us. After all, they are part of the problem and they need to be part of the solution. But I mean, there is a need for, uh, I believe, for that sort of uh, political engagement across the Arab world for people to reach out more uh, and um, I don't know. I mean, I'd like Nabil's view really on the sort of the future of that Arab interaction um, uh, and how it should be progressed. In the book, he does uh, sort of affirm his attachment to the idea. Maybe things would move a little bit uh, if there was a spark. And I, in conclusion, agree very strongly with Martin Indyk um, that it is important to hear an Egyptian voice which is clear and which will speak to what I take to be an almost universal uh, Arab sentiment in one form or another uh, in relation to what might be about to happen with regard to uh, the West Bank and so on. And this is a place, I think, where that voice, which is compelling and speaks for 100 million people, Arab people, is uh, important to listen to. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Derek, for your intervention. Um, we have really a full roster of, of questions. So let me very quickly add on my uh, my, my question, uh, and then go back to Mr. Fahmi to address this full roster of, um, of points. Um, I, um, I really found very interesting the, and I think it's one of the sort of ins most incisive comments that we've got so far on the very last days of, not really very last days, but very lost years of the Mubarak time. And I think you, you do a great job really describing some of the sort of um, difficulties that were starting to emerge from um, just too much stability, uh, if, you can say, if you can say that. Um, and, uh, and a sense of lack of initiative and sometimes also 
um, lack of purpose. And I think that is, it, you know, it's a testimony that I think will also be joined as, as others will start to write their perspectives on this. And it's, it's, an, it's an area and a period that we're now also looking, looking back to and sort of like trying to come to grips with. My question is, and you focus a lot um, uh, on, the, on the idea of transition. And I think the, the, the last years of Mubarak and the sort of the Tahrir days uh, were, can, can also be seen in, in, in the context of how Egypt is managing that transition because it was becoming obvious that a transition is needed. And I think, and I found very interesting your recount in the book of the Wiseman Committee which I remember at the time where everyone was uh, very kind of like driven by sort of uh, emotional ideas about radical change, came across at that time as, as trying to sort of uh, steer kind of like a, a, a middle way in, into, into this crisis. Something that perhaps now with the benefit of hindsight and more evaluation, we need to revisit and, and actually see how some of these civil society initiatives, even if by prominent um, voices in, in, in the society, were actually put forward in order to manage that transition. Um, was there any chance something like this would have worked, you think? Um, uh, you also mentioned the mission of Ambassador uh, Frank Wisner uh, to Cairo and how that kind of like confused, and I think confused things in, in Egypt, or at least, <laughs> give mixed messages, messages to some people. I think my, my larger question is, was there any chance that this transition would have been managed in a better way? Um, or not? Um, and I leave, and I have other questions, but I leave it at that and then perhaps come later with the Q&A. We have a very long list of uh, Q&A from, from the audience. So I'm really keen to get through them, but let's first go back to Minister Fahmi before we we go to the to the floor again. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi. So uh, the mute and the and the video are not controlled by me, so I I, I couldn't turn on because of that. Anyway, oh. let me answer the points because they're all, all excellent points. Uh, I'm an, I'm passionately Egyptian, but I be honestly, and I'm not objective about it. I'm, this is beyond being objective. I, uh, where I'm self-critical is because I think we can do better. Uh, that being said, I look at Egypt as part of a region, not only in our, in our borders, and part of a region that has also a international role. Uh, otherwise, we can't be the main player if it's simply based on our material assets. It's actually on our intellectual contribution to our regional order and our international order. Uh, Having said that, with all due respect to the big powers, war and peace was our game. It wasn't there. We decided to go to war by mistake and then intentionally, and then we decided to go to peace. They ran after us when we started to do it, but we couldn't conclude it without them. So I actually am a strong believer of regional players determining direction and that international players will react to them if you take the lead within your own region, I cannot compete with the US in Latin America or with the US in Asia, but I can compete with them in the Middle East, believe me, I can, because they're busy all over the world, not because I'm stronger, but because they have different priorities. And so my point, which I know Martin and, and, and uh, Sir, Der Sir Derek are also making, I think we can play a very important role in our region in spite of all the challenges that we face. And, uh, the challenges are, at least the, when I was there and even now, still quite, uh, quite strong. But unless regional players lead, the region will not get better. We will be a complement to somebody else's interest. Um, to, to do that, we need to have a vision. We cannot be reactive. If we're, if we're being reactive, we compare material assets. If we're being proactive, then we're trying to control the agenda. And then you balance in the, the ideas, the vision, the political weight, the history, as well as the material assets. You cannot do without assets. But frankly, if it's assets alone, we would not be a major player. 
in our region. It's much more our intellectual assets. So I'm all for proactive diplomacy. And by the way, diplomats make mistakes. We occasionally fail, uh, not frequently, but occasionally fail. Uh, so I don't consider making initiatives and then not succeeding as being a failure. It's just an effort you keep, as long as they're consistent with where you want to go strategically and you don't pay a price for them, that is higher than not speaking. Uh, secondly, I would argue very openly that there's nobody in the region that can talk about North Africa, about the Gulf, about Sub-Saharan Africa, about what's happening in the Levant, on the Mediterranean, on every single topic. There's nobody in the region that can do that as much as we can. <laughs> and there's nobody contra containing us except ourselves. Yes. So we can do more, point blank, no reservations, no cadence. Uh, my second point, uh, as I said, again, you have to have vision. You have to have vision and a policy, by the way. Vision first, strategy second, and then the policy, not the other way around. Because these things take time and you pay a price for each one of them. Um, but let me add another point here. There were some specific questions and I'll, I'll run through them. Um, the issue of the Clinton parameters, I think uh, Ambassador Plumby basically answered a little bit what, uh, what Martin was asking about. By the time the Clinton parameters were set forward, President Mubarak by that time was already annoyed with the Clinton administration that they seemed to be taking him for granted. He was, because he had been in power for over 20 years by then, also getting increasingly bored with the whole process and frustrated it was not succeeding. And, and I say this respectfully, we basically had three different presidents Mubarak. President Mubarak in his first 10 years was one president. President Mubarak in his second 10 years was the next president. President Mubarak in his third 10 years was a third president in terms of how he managed the state not in terms of his uh, basic uh, centrist approach. A and by that third 10 years, you really need to engage him to attract his attention, to play the role that he would have played naturally in the first 10 years or during the second 10 years. Uh, and the example for that is when he was asked to uh, participate in the liberation of Kuwait, he did. He said he would not go into Iraq, but he did not hesitate to fight against an Arab country to liberate an Arab country, which was unique, frankly, in, in our part of the region. And the Syrians wouldn't have joined if we had said no. So his readiness to play, if you want, the ice-breaking role decreased over time because of the longevity of his presence in office. But it also was a function of the Two main, well, one main power was disintegrating the Soviet Union, but the Americans were taking it for granted. And this kept annoying him. So, it, and I say this honestly, and I worked with, with the president closely on many occasions, it was increasingly difficult to convince him to take on any American initiative because they always seemed to ask for something only when they needed it and ignored Egypt and the rest of the time. And that simply did not work for again, an Egyptian who looked at Egypt as being the main player in the region. Uh, so that's really why we didn't jump to the Clinton parameters. Uh, it was not because we were, we were against them. And I personally conveyed my proposals to Cairo that these, these parameters, we should ensure that Arafat's reservations are respected, but that they should be taken as a plus with reservations rather than a no uh, so we could move forward. Um, the, there is, I'm not going to hold back on this. Annexation will destroy any possible role for a two-state solution. It's already, I mean, I, I start off by commending and criticizing the Rabin Perez uh, uh, administration because they wanted to achieve peace, but they hesitated on settlements. But they wanted to achieve peace. 
Now, to go as far as we are now, where we're actually annexing territories, these guys who wanted peace then were saying it's very difficult to remove settl settlers now. There's, no, there's not going to be a two-state solution if we keep moving forward on this. And I'm not speaking as an Egyptian official. I'm speaking as an Egyptian. But what I'm telling you is what I say here back home. We should be very, very vocal. And it's important to preempt the crisis rather than to face it. And the is, BB may get angry, but he cannot afford to uh, ignore Egypt. And we have to understand that, that we have a positive uh, element and we have a negative element as well. Now, we, we should and continue to always pursue the more positive one. But the idea that one side or the other can get angry, with all due respect, I'm not in this to make anybody happy. I'm in this to pursue Egypt's national interest. And they are strategic much more than tactical. So I'm with both of you. We should be more vocal on the annexation. Uh, and it's not about waiting for anybody else. We never waited for anybody else to speak out. We need to speak out. Uh, very quickly, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, are, the criticism we used to get, of, or if you want, the commendations we used to get internationally, we used to get them locally as well. Even some of our colleagues would say, well, why don't you guys ever calm down and stop making proposals? But that's why people heard us. They didn't always agree with us. And unless you start, unless you play that role, well, they're going to go, people will go and look at where is the dollar, where are dollars and cents. And the dollars and cents are not even in the West any longer. They're not in the Middle East. They're much more in Asia. So I need to play the role using my intellectual assets. The NPT, very quickly, uh, the NPT, we swallowed hard to go along with the vote, going along with the resolution, which went on without a vote, because the language said there was a widespread majority. Had it said consensus, we would vote no. Mm -hmm. But we accepted it because it was well drafted diplomatically by Ambassador Nikola, the chair of the conference. But the interesting point is, because of the conference, because we were vocal before and after, Shimon Peres actually agreed to a proposal I personally made. And then because I knew he wouldn't, he wouldn't respect it, I told my boss, he's not, going to come, he's not going to deliver on this. So let's not jump out of the gun, but let's see if he does. And of course he did. Uh, that being said, we're not going to have security in the region if there's an imbalance in national security capacity. Whether it is a direct balance or an indirect balance. There is not going to be security. And one way or the other, there's going to be an arms race. And it's very important here to understand that. This is not anti-Israel or anti-Iran. When I look at, our, at issues that are peace and war or national security, they are about strategic relations, not about who's in government today or who's in government tomorrow. And it needs a better uh, balance. Um, yeah, I did got a, get a lot of bruises, frankly, uh, when I was in Washington about domestic affairs, but I gave out my share as well, uh, particularly when they decided to go into Iraq. Uh, but let me leave that aside. Uh, I honestly believe in looking towards Egypt's role uh, forward, if I may. And also, well, let me do that and then I'll do the, the, the uh, Wiseman issue. The Middle East is not going to calm down in the short term, and it's not going to calm come, come down unless Arabs become more proactive. The, the silence of Arab diplomacy is bizarre. In, you cannot have five fires ongoing in Libya, uh, in uh, the Syrian situation, the, the Yemeni situation, the lack of an Arab peace process, and of course the Iran uh, Gulf area. Only recently, that we have two Arab initiatives on Libya, the Egyptian one and the one the day after from Algeria. Before that, there was everything from around the world. How can that be the case? It's just not logical. So Arab diplomacy has to be more engaged. And I would add to that, for you to be more engaged, you need to deal with two deficiencies. And a, a, a generic resistance to, to incremental change. The world is going to change. 
So we might as well embrace the change and deal with it rather than react to explosions rather than change. And secondly, uh, there is a national security imbalance between Arabs and non-Arabs because of an over-dependence of Arabs on foreign parties. Foreign parties will come in to help in existential situations. They're not going to come in and to develop to secure your borders on non-existential issues. And that's where the regional players play in and we need to, uh, to be more active on that. Uh, the Wiseman issue and the transition. Look, I mentioned intentionally uh, that our transition started in 1952 because I think our, we had, we've always had a pluralistic political system. Actually, we had it before 52, and then we resumed it later. We have about 114 parties today, but we don't have a pluralistic political culture any longer. In other words, there are parties in name, but they're not really engaged in an ongoing debate about different policy issues, different opinions, and ultimately find a way to work together. I'm not talking working together beyond the Constitution. I'm just talking about having this, this political debate. Now, this eroded from 52 onwards. And because of that, when 2011 happened, there was nobody out there on the street who could really, if you want, generate momentum to create a party or a political force. The only force out there was the Brotherhood, on the one hand, or the old institutions, which had really uh, been the beginning of, of this end. So that's why it, it made it so difficult. And the, the new leaders of 2011, be they the young, youth or in Beretta or whoever, uh, frankly, didn't also have the institutional mechanisms to, okay, let's put together an, a, a committee, let's develop the parties, let's do the institutions. So we came up with this proposal to have a soft landing. And let me quickly say here, we met with members of the youth and they came to us and they said, point blank, you're talking tactics, we're talking strategy. We're not talking about changing one law or the other. We're talking about changing the system. So we respect your integrity, but you have to understand the, 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 the ambitions we have to move forward. That was fine with us, as long as it didn't mean tearing everything down. We wanted to have a more open engagement, more checks and balances, more transparency, much more accountability. Uh, but we didn't want to tear down the whole system to do it if we could find a way not to do it because the options tearing it down where you want to go to a vote, you're going to end up with those who can get the vote out more quickly and it's not going to be the result people want. I'm not arguing here that the ballot box in normal circumstances should not be the determining factor. It should. But you also should choose the right time to hold the election. And I, because I can see Martin smiling at me there, I'm going to pick on him for a second. I remember, frankly, uh, the push for Palestinian elections. When we were screaming, you want to hold the elections now, you're going to get Hamas to win the parliamentary elections. We weren't against the elections, but it's a matter of the timing of the election. Anyway, uh, transition is going to take time. I am a strong supporter of 2011. I also think 2013 was necessary because it was a, in defense of our identity. But 2011 and 2013 were a call for playing a role in determining our future, and we need more openness to do that. Great. I, I missed the Wisner question because, frankly, Frank has to explain that. I don't know what the answer to that is. <laughs> I think I think he I think he Ambassador Frank Wisner might actually be on the attendees uh, list, but hopefully that can be the the, the subject of a, another webinar, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> because I'm not sure how we can technically get him to contribute um, on the <laughs> webinar. Um, so uh, let me let me collect some of the questions that we've got and apologize for those who I won't be able to um, relay their questions to the panel because the questions uh, we received too many questions actually for the time available. So I really apologize for this. So the, um, 
So I'll group the questions in, in chunks. And, and I think one chunk refers, goes back to what you discussed when it comes to the um, MPT. And there is a question from uh, Bob Einhorn from Brookings um, asking about um, the, the so what question. If, if Egypt joining the MPT was a mistake, what are the prospects for Egypt to reconsider that decision or to withdraw from the MPT? And I think he's trying to be provocative here, even <laughs> two nuclear weapons. Um, there's another question about the wisdom of expanding the nuclear weapon free zone to include chemical and biological weapons as well. Was that, uh, how, do you, how do you see that now looking, looking from where we we're at? Um, and then there are questions that, that actually take Egypt's foreign policy slightly beyond the Arab-Israeli context. So obviously questions about the Ethiopian dam, which is causing a lot of debate and anxiety uh, in Cairo. Um, and basically, how can Egypt reformulate its relationship with, uh, with Africa uh, beyond just drawing on the history of um, collaboration under Nasser and so on. So how can that be revived and be put in the service of resolving the uh, Ethiopian dam? Um, there, is, there are a few questions about Libya as well and um, Turkey's involvement, which I think fits into a larger picture about uh, sort of regional alliances and how they are forming and to what extent you see that Egypt might be in a position to get drawn into uh, a confrontation either in Libya or when it comes to Ethiopia. So questions that looks into the broader Egyptian context uh, as well. So, so if you can take these questions, that would be, that would be great. And, and again, I apologize for those who've, um, who've contributed questions because of the time we won't be able to cover. Sure, thank you, Hassan. If you send me their questions, I will send them answers uh, after I think them carefully. But anyway, uh, yeah. on the NPT, uh, my point was the N it was wrong to join the NPT alone. We actually signed the NPT the very first day it was open for signature in 1968. But we said we would not ratify unless the Israelis did. So I wasn't against joining the NPT if the Israelis did. The NPT, by the way, is not a very good treaty, but it was the best one out there uh, given the alternatives. So my, my criticism was joining it unilaterally. We actually asked the Israelis to join when we signed the peace agreement with them, and they refused to do that at the time as well. Uh, let me just pick on Bob for a second. I think they, as I said in the book, I think they gave us a tremendous opportunity to negotiate when they overreached, as we did at the beginning of the NPT, when they overreached to try to get a decision without a vote, and then to get a decision, uh, um, sorry, a, a unanimous decision, and then a decision without a vote. So we've decided to, okay, let's get something out of this. Uh, we have been criticism, criticized in Egypt for not focusing all, only on nuclear, but also in suggesting having a zone free of weapons, of chemical weapons and biological weapons as well. Uh, some of our purists believe that was the wrong mistake. It may have been. I support the proposal, nevertheless. It was made in good faith to try to take into account concerns the Israeli had about chemical weapons, potentially in some Arab countries, and also concerns uh, of Arabs vis-a-vis -vis the Israeli nuclear program. So it was done in good faith. It did not work regrettably, but it's still there. Uh, and a point that, Der that Sir Derek made, we got a commitment from the three depositories to take this issue seriously at the NPT, and they went back on their word blatantly. And that's something which uh, we will never forget. And they have to remember that the next time they come knocking on the door. The second issue, uh, the Ethiopian dam. I just wrote an article that was published yesterday. I think this is a major crisis. We have two major crises on our hands, and they're both national security crises the Nile water issue. We use 85% of our water consumption comes from the Nile. We don't have any substantial options besides the Nile. Uh, any irregularities there creates a problem. The second issue, uh, which I will also mention, is the Libyan issue. Creating a regional, creating a Syrian situation in Libya is a national security problem for us. So we have two national security crises 
at the same time, potentially there. That being said, not everything means war, uh, and I would hope not. I just wrote an article yesterday suggesting that let's respect each other's historic rights, but in actual fact, there's more war than any of us need. And let's focus more on how do we have a better utilization of water, not only as a result of the dam, but all, all on the Nile Basin area completely. And not only on the usage of water, but also how do you make agriculture more efficient? How do you generate energy more efficient, more efficiently? And look at how do you take advantage of not only the Nile water, but also the rainwater and the different sources of water in that region. And I suggest having three levels of decision making. The very first one, which is national. Then you have a tripartite version if there's a disagreement. And then if we still disagree, it goes to arbitration, to a quick arbitration of, uh, uh, if you want, uh, independent uh, individuals whose decisions are mandatory. Uh, the third component to that is let's try to develop a Marshall Plan for this whole region. So we create a win-win situation for the region. I know with COVID-19, with the economic crisis, it's not the best uh, timing to do that. But I didn't choose the timing for crisis. I just deal with them when they come. Uh, but I actually think if one looks at how do we solve the, how do we use the potential of the area much rather than how do we resolve the debate about who is wrong and who is right, because these are problems caused by the lack of strategic thinking. These issues could have been dealt with by all of us much better if they were dealt, were dealt with uh, 15, 20 years ago. And I would very anecdotally simply mention when I visited Africa frequently, the African president would tell me, you're only the second Egyptian who doesn't tell us what you did for us. And is talking more about what happens now and in the future rather than what you did for us in the past. And I said, well, I just like to save time. But what we did for you, put that in the bank. Uh, but yeah, I wanted, but seriously speaking, the reason I would do that is Egypt is 70% youth. And Africa is about 60% youth. They don't want to talk about history. They want to talk about their present and their future. And there's room for, for, role, for, for, for a role there. So I would argue strategy, vision is important even here. Maybe as a major problem major problem and uh, at the beginning of the year I wrote an article that this may be there was a lot of talk then that the Americans would bomb Iran and they might they might not I don't know uh, that being said last January I wrote that if Turkey expands in Libya this may be the first conflict of the year now I would hope not but this is not an issue that we can allow to rest lightly because it creates a tremendous security problem, physical problem on the border, and a potentially imbalance in the region. Now, I saw the Egyptian initiative. I also read the Berlin mandates. I heard what the Algerians uh, suggested. I really hope we find a way to dialogue to move forward. My last point to make here is, as we look forward towards the Middle East, I focus mostly on my brothers in the Arab world, but I actually think we need to have a tough love discussion uh, as Arabs with Turkey, Iran, and Israel. Tough love by way of let's be candid, let's be straightforward, but let's try to look towards a future together rather than only a debate about history. We're not going to be able to have a better future without resolving the historic problems. But trying to resolve them on the ground by talking to the superpowers or by talking to surrogates or by doing this or that is not going to be a solution. It's important for us to respect good neighborly relations, but ultimately to find a way to dialogue. I would not start by holding conferences. I would start by choosing a small number of emissaries to develop confidence building measures to prepare for whatever dialogues be held in the future. Great. Thank you so much. I think we breezed through the 90 minutes that we had for, for, today's, uh, for today's session. Uh, we could have easily had another 30 minutes, but I'm afraid we have to um, end now. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Minister Fahmi, Ambassador Indek, 
Sir Derek, for joining us uh, today and for sharing your thoughts openly and for triggering this interesting discussion. And also thank you everyone who joined us from, um, from all over the world, really. We had like a very long list of attendees today and we're very grateful for your interest and time. Uh, and I hope you all keep well and safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.